Welcome to our YouTube channel. We're so glad that you could join us. Hope you are ready and expectant for a powerful, powerful sermon that will bless your heart. Here it is. So I'm just going to pray and we're going to get into today's message. And maybe let me set up the message before I pray. So um, we had the wonderful privilege of having Keith minister to us for three weeks. And that was a delight and it was a real treasure having Keith um, minister. And so thank you very much again, Keith. I know last week Alan Simons was with us. But just to say thank you to, to Keith and Shelley, we went and had, um, we had lunch. Hey? It wasn't breakfast. We didn't do the breakfast. We did lunch. And we were just chatting. And Keith said something like he does, little things that just go off in my, in my heart and in my spirit and kind of set me off on something. And he, he just reminded me in that conversation, he was sharing something with me. And he just said, you know, um, the whole gamut of Scripture, all of Scripture, points us towards God's desire that we should flourish. That we should flourish. And that just did something in my heart for me. To hear again that my Father in Heaven loves me and wants me to flourish. <laughs> to flourish. When last did you use that word about your life? Flourish. <laughs> like, we laughed at someone say, how's it going? You go, it's flourishing. <laughs> now you're giggling because that's not generally how it goes. We're dealing with hardships and all kinds of things. And such is life. And we, we encounter all kinds of things that don't make sense and make us feel like what's going on and where are you sometimes in all of this, God? But I want to show you through the scriptures this morning, just quickly that actually God wants you to flourish he wants your life to abound with blessing he wants you to be fruitful he wants your life to be a constant joy <laughs> he wants you to live with a deep sense of his peace that nothing absolutely nothing could go so wrong in your life as to move you off of fellowship or move you away from fellowship with King Jesus. Yeah. He is wonderful and His intention for your life is that you flourish. So let's pray and we'll jump in to the Scriptures this morning. Father, thank You for Keith. <laughs> I thank You for good godly men you speak things into our lives that inspire us and encourage us to pursue you with more passion, with more commitment. And I pray this morning, Lord, as we jump into the scriptures, every life in this room would be invigorated and empowered and enthused with a passion to go after you, Father God, and to believe you for your promise to flourish. So bless us, Lord, this morning as we look at the scriptures. May wisdom and revelation knowledge explode on the inside of us. May you help us to see what we may have never seen before. And to, with a fresh faith, believe you for your best. Amen? Amen. 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 So I want you to start with me in the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. Oh. Excuse me, I'm just trying to get my Bible open here. So it's Galatians chapter 1, and I'm going to read to you verses 3, and uh, 3, 4, and let's we'll do 5, 2. This is uh, Paul writing to this church and he says this in Galatia he says to them grace to you and peace from God the Father sorry from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ Paul is saying to us this morning that grace and peace come from the Father and from the Son Lord what can I expect from you what, Lord's in your heart for me? Lord, what would you say to me, God? What would you give to me? And Paul says to you and I, we should expect grace and peace. Grace and peace. God has lavished on us His grace. 
His favor and unmerited favor. God has chosen you. He, we didn't look for him. He found us. John 15. Remember John 15? The Bible says, Jesus says to his disciples, you didn't choose me. I chose you. It's a, it's a favorite scripture for me. It just gives my heart a, a, sense, of, um, a sense of relief sometimes. That I didn't choose him, he chose me. It was in God's heart to come and find me. Yeah. Grace is God pursuing you. Grace is God coming after you. Grace is God choosing to favor you and to bless you. Yeah, and to do good to you. Good. And he's done it at his own prerogative. God has chosen. You know, God is sovereign. And that word sovereign sometimes can befuddle us a little bit as Christians. Because there's so many very clever intellectual theologians that try to define and redefine and put it in its rightful place. What it means for God to be sovereign. And sometimes we can define, define the sovereignty of, of God in, maybe in, in these kind of terms. That God has chosen unequivocally. He has chosen every little aspect of your life. He has preordained, pre-organized, pre-arranged for every sneeze, every cough, and every blink. <laughs> and that everything that happens in your life is by His design. Now I'd say that that's not true. I say it's not true because we encounter all kinds of chaos and we encounter all kinds of sinfulness and brokenness and, and mayhem and it just doesn't accord with all that God has done. It just doesn't come into agreement with all that God has done because God in Christ Jesus came into the world and when he was hung up on that cross, he drew all sin or pain or suffering to himself so that he could draw it out of the earth and redeem our lives from destruction. So it doesn't make sense to me that God is sovereign in those terms. God may be sovereign in this way, that He knows all things. Yeah. Yeah. That there's nothing that escapes His knowledge. That He knows all things. But God is also sovereign in this way. He is sovereign in that He is not answerable to anybody. Exactly. God is not accountable to you and me for what He chooses to do. And if He chooses to love you, and if He chooses to bless you, and if He chooses to favor you, and if He chooses to raise you up, then it has nothing to do with me, and God is not answerable to me. God is not living to my account. Peter has a moment with Jesus that is kind of unfolds in a similar fashion. He's sitting on a beach having a fish breakfast with Jesus. They had been fishing. Jesus had been raised from the dead. Remember, Peter had denied Jesus. And what he had done is he went back to his fishing business. He thought maybe this ministry gig wasn't going to work out for him. But Jesus comes to find him. Why? Because Jesus chose Peter. Peter didn't choose Jesus. Right? And so they're sitting on a beach. And God speaks to Peter. And he kind of says to Peter, you know, your life, it's going to be like you're bound and you're going to be led wherever, you know, you're bound and you're going to be led by your captive, but wherever you go, and he's kind of trying to figure that out. And, you know, some people think it was talking about how he would die for the Lord. And, you know, um, Fox's book, book of Martyr and Christian history tells us that Peter was crucified upside down. In fact, they say that he was about to be killed and he kind of ran out of the town and the Lord spoke to him and he went back. And when they wanted to crucify him, he said, don't crucify me in the same manner as my Lord. I'm not worthy of that. And so they crucified him upside down. That's what church history tells us. But then he, Jesus starts to speak about John. And it's, and it's kind of like this amazing thing that's going to happen with John. Like, you know, that John might live forever until Jesus comes back. And then Peter questions this. And God, Jesus says to Peter, what, this doesn't have anything to do with you. <laughs> what I do with John's life and how I choose to bless John's life and what I do with him doesn't have anything to do with you, Peter. But I'm still going to do things with you. And so I just, I just use that as a reference to say, God in His grace has chosen you. And if you're sitting here this morning, and if you are born again, if you have said yes to Jesus because the Holy Spirit fired up your spirit and gave you faith, and you believed, and you've trusted in Jesus, and you've more than just trusted in Him, you've bowed to Him as King, King of all creation, your King, the Sovereign Lord of all creation, if you have done that, then you have merited His favor. You have received His grace. And in Romans chapter 8, the Bible says that if God did not spare His Son, why would He not with Him freely give us all things? 
God says to you this morning, if I gave my son for you, why would I withhold anything else from you? Paul says to us this morning through the scriptures, he says, grace and peace. They are yours from the Father and from the Son. Paul in the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 5 and verse 5, he says, we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace with God. We have peace with God. For some of us, we're going, I didn't know I had any beef with him to start off with. <laughs> you see, the reality is that sin left us as an enemy of God. Sin left us at odds with God. Our sin separated us from Him, and it didn't just separate us from Him, because we didn't just get separated from God to live in our sin. We lived in our sin in joy and delight. And we scorned the Lord. And we delighted in not what was righteous or holy or just or, or kind or loving. We, we, we rejoiced in all that was wrong. And you go, I wasn't that bad. I had the wonderful privilege of leading my mom to Jesus. And I have shared this story, I think, before. And um, when, I, when, I, when I had the privilege, I led her to the Lord over the phone. I was laying in my bed one night, cause at worship team practice, this was a number of years ago. And I had the most overwhelming sense that my mom was going to die. It, you know, at first I was just like, I rebuked it. I was like, you know, and it just gnawed at me. So I didn't phone my mom and say, Mom, I think you're going to die. You better accept Jesus. I didn't do that. I kind of had a sense, Lord, you are, you are showing me her current reality. We, we, we fail to recognize sometimes the weight of sin. It's icy grip on a person. And that nothing can free us from that grip. Nothing can, from, nothing can untangle us or in this world. Nothing can untangle us from the debt owed for our sin. And I guess in that moment, I just sensed the weight of that for my mom. And so I got on the phone and I just lovingly just spoke to her about the Lord. I was like, Mom, you, I just have, you, you need to know Jesus. He loves you. Because up until that point, every time I try to share the gospel with my mom, this little skinny Portuguese lady, every time I would tell her about the gospel and I would try to explain to her that she is a sinner, she would stop me. She loved everything I had to say until that point. And I'd say, Mom, you're a sinner and you need to be forgiven. You're unrighteous. She goes, I'm not a sinner. I'm a nice person. I've never killed anybody. I don't steal from anybody. I've been a good mom to you. Haven't I been a good mom to you? I'm a nice person. And at this point... I get a little frustrated with my mother. <laughs> I'm like, Mom, I wish you could see from my perspective. No, I'm just eating. <laughs> but the point is, there was this self-righteousness in her. There was this sense of, I've done nothing wrong to offend God. But we have. But we have. Because we choose, more often than not, things other than Him. To make us joyful. We delight in things other than God. But the Bible says we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And everything, every debt of, of our sin that we owed to Jesus, He forgave. And not only did He forgive, He paid for. Not only did He um, pay for, He expunged from our lives. He removed our sin from us as far as the east is from the west. And He has liberated us from that. And so all that remains is that God has grace and peace for you. And Paul writes to the church in Galatia and he writes to us this morning, the church in Amanzim, Texas, and he says, hey, grace and peace is all the Father has for you this morning. Isn't that beautiful? It's such good news. It's buried in the gospel and it's true for us this morning. And then he says this. He says, talking about Jesus Christ, he says, who gave himself for our sins, we've worked that out in, as we've spoken, that He might deliver us. 
Jesus' intention was to deliver you. You were a captive. He came to set you free. His intention was to free you, to liberate you, to bring you into a new life. He says that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of God our Father. So this is the deal. Jesus came to liberate you and to set you free as is the will of the Father. He's come to deliver you from what? From this present evil age. We live in a world that's filled with mayhem and chaos. So this morning we took a moment to pray for Israel. I said to Pat when, he, when we were chatting, I said, we cannot pray for Israel and not pray for the Palestinians. <laughs> we must be careful to see Israel or the Israelis or the Israelites as, the, as just the perfect people in the story because we have all sinned. <laughs> and we have all fallen short of the glory of God. And the Palestinians, as much as the Isra is Israelis need to keep the law, they need to believe in Christ Jesus. There once was a pastor who sat with, um, he sat with um, the leader of Hamas. What was that man's name? Keith. Yasser Arafat. He sat with Yasser Arafat and, a, and one of the, the, the Israeli prime ministers at the time. And he was sitting in a room and he was talking to them. And they were kind of questioning him about some things. And one of them asked them about, it, about the state of Israel and what they should do. And he sat there for a moment a little perplexed. He, he didn't know what to say. And then he said something to this effect. He looked at both these great leaders in a room with some other Christian leaders. And he said, until you understand that 2,000 years ago, God marched His Son up a hill just outside of the city and there crucified him for all of humanity until you realize that his life was given for you and that he died to set you free and that you must be reconciled to God through his son you will continue to march your sons and daughters onto the battlefields of this life you see only Christ the king can bring peace Peace in us and peace between us. And unless we trust God for the peace of Jerusalem, for His peace upon that nation, and His peace upon the, those, all the nations, and His peace comes through the Prince of Peace, the King of Glory, the righteous God of all creation, Jesus the righteous. And only in Him. So keep praying for Israel and all its people. Keep trusting God. For his great plan of redemption and salvation to unfold in the nations in the way that he intended. Because we have peace with him. We have grace from him. And it is part of his plan to deliver us. Because we do live in a world where people want to break into homes and steal what they can. And if they murder people in the process, so be it. We do live in a world where bandits of people want to break into nations and do what they want to do. There is evil in the world, but Jesus says, I want to deliver you from this present evil age. So I want you quickly to jump with me, because we've got about 16 minutes left. It's my birthday, I was going to ask for the day off. But... <laughs> to be honest, this is one of my favorite places to be. Not just because I get to preach or to do this thing, but I honestly love being at church here on a Sunday. Um, it just is so much fun to hang out with you guys. But listen to this. In Genesis 26, so one, gen oh, sorry, not Genesis 26, my apologies. Genesis 1, 26. You'll know the scripture again. It just says this. Then God said, let us make man in our image. According to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle, over all the earth and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man, how? In his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. Then, what comes next is the very first words. God speaks, not over creation, 
but over man. God is not in an incessant talker. He's not an incessant talker. You know what an incessant talker is? It's, um, it's when you, well, maybe a good way to define it, and I've used this before, is if you get in a car with little children and you go on a long trip <laughs> and you try to explain to a three-year-old that Cape Town is a long, long, long way away. And so you pull out the driveway and you get to the bottom of the road and they go, are we there yet? <laughs> and at this point you have a whole lot of patience and you're just feeling like the dad of the century and you go, no, we're not there yet. It's a long drive, sweetheart. And they proceed to ask the same question every three minutes for the next 47 kilometers. That's incessant. They're talking without any understanding, not intentionally to irritate you, but it just does. God is not that way. When God speaks, it's intentional. When God takes a moment to breathe His Word into your life, it is on purpose. It is for your benefit. It is to bring you into life and liberty and freedom. This morning, as God spoke to those with our problems and bladder problems and children that need to be in school, God did it because He meant to intervene on your behalf. He meant to deliver you from this present evil age. He meant to heal you and to favor you and to bring you into His good pleasure for your life. God's intention is for you to flourish. And so these are God's first words as He speaks not over creation but over man. And He says in verse 28, Then God blessed them. <laughs> the first act in dealing with man is God's blessing on us. And then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. He said, fill the earth and subdue it. He said, have dominion over the fish of the sea. And right there, he ordained the brafles. He said, have dominion over the fish of the sea. Have a fish bra. Over the birds of the air. Nando's. And over every living thing that comes <laughs> or that moves on the earth. God's intention was for us to be blessed. To be blessed. To be fruitful and to multiply. And everything in it was for us. And when God dreamt of Nando's, He dreamt of a little Portuguese fella. And so we just thank Jesus for the porras and peri peri. I'm just. <laughs> I want to say to you, I want to get it into your heart this morning that your God, the God of all creation, the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, through his Son Jesus, made his intention known to you and I, ties us back to his original intent in the garden to bless you, to flourish, for your life to flourish, for you to. Be fruitful and to multiply and for you to subdue the earth for you to live in its blessing in its abundance in its goodness you know I'm not a I'm not a um, careful how I say this you know we're constantly told that the resources are gonna um, run out in our, in our on a planet okay so I want to say to you we need to be good stewards don't throw your rubbish on the ground Put it in a dustbin. Don't pour out your terps paint that you cleaned your brush, your, you know, your paintbrush with down the drain. Get rid of it probably. Don't throw your light bulbs, your LED ones, just in the rubbish. Take them to that little dustbin at Woolworths. Be good stewards. That's what I mean. We need to be good stewards of the earth that we live in and the planet that we live in. But I want to tell you, I don't think God limited what was here. I don't think we're going to run out. I think there's enough. We need to look after it, but there's enough. And so God says, I want you to live in the earth and I want you to have dominion over it because there's enough. There's enough to go around, so be generous. There's enough. Part of what it means to live a flourishing life, and we're going to talk about these things in the weeks to come, 
is that God wants us to live generous lives. Generous lives. Because His blessing upon you is, more, is, more, is, is not just for you, but it's to move through you. So quickly go with me to Genesis chapter 12. Just move through a couple of pages. Genesis chapter 12. So God's intention is to bless us, puts us in the paradise, and He gives us dominion and authority, and then it all goes a little bit wonky and wobbly, and it's trouble, and sin comes in, you know the story, and then what happens is God still wants to bless the earth. He still wants to bless the earth. He still wants to bless man. He still wants to bring you into joy and delight. And so He finds a man named Abram. And Abram is not a Christian, by the way. He's not even a good Israelite Hebrew boy. He's a pagan idol worshiper. (laughs) Who he calls out of his father's country. And God in his sovereignty, in his, um, in his, you may get that. (laughs) It may be a blessing. (laughs) Maybe someone saying, I got money for you. (laughs) Or can I take you for lunch? If someone says they're going to buy you lunch, say yes, please. I hope it's not me. All right, no, it's not. Thanks. Praise Jesus. <laughs> just teasing. If it, I don't know who that is because I can't, I only got one ear, just so that you know. <laughs> I know, Vanessa, don't laugh at me like that. But I'm not very good with sounds. So if I'm walking in Galleria and you say, hey, where's? And, I, and you call from this side and I go, <laughs> it's because I, I don't know where the sound's coming from. So I don't know whose phone's ringing. So be blessed. Don't be embarrassed. Promises to Abram. So God finds this man, Abram, calls him out of his father's country, out of idol worship, and he says to him, Now the Lord said to Abram, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse those who curse you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Immediately I go, what is going on in Abram's life that God wants to do all of these good things to him? And then I realized nothing. God chose him because actually God's intention was that through the seed of Abraham, and Paul makes this emphatic point, not seeds, not Lots, one, through Jesus Christ, because Jesus would come from, the, from Abraham, from the loins of Abraham, through all of his family, we would get Jesus. And God's intention wasn't just to bless Abraham, it was to bless you and me through Abraham, because Jesus would come. Through all the chaos, all the mess, I don't know what you have, would have decided if you were part of a panel or in a council that had to fix up the mess after sin. I don't know what you would have done. Maybe you're like, let's press alt delete. What is that? You know, what is that thing? Control alt delete. Boop. We just boom, gone. We start again. It's quite interesting that God did not start again. Instead, he t- chose to take responsibility for a mess he didn't make. Because his intention was to bless you. You are so unique in creation that God can just erase you from creation. When he gave you life, he gave you a holy, sacred thing. He gave you, in essence, something that is of Him, of His very nature. Because there is no life apart from God. And so God made you from the very substance of His nature. He made you from the very reality of His being. And you cannot just be erased. But you can be redeemed. And you can be restored. And you can be saved. And so that's what he chooses to do. He chooses to find a man through whom he can bless the nations. Now it doesn't just end with Abraham. We don't have time to go through all the scriptures. It doesn't just end with Abraham. God keeps on doing this thing. He finds different people along the way to bless and to do good things through. You know, at the end of the book of Genesis, we find the big story of Joseph. 
Remember Joseph? And Joseph becomes a, a parable. It's a real story, but it becomes this, this metaphor, this parable for all of our lives. Joseph is a top Jesus. And Jesus, like Joseph, was sold by his brothers. On that day when Jesus stood before Pilate, Pontius Pilate, and one of the Gospels marks that, that, that Pilate said, hey, listen, this is, this is not good because I think this guy's innocent. I don't think he's done anything wrong. So what we'll do is there's another guy here who's done a whole lot wrong. He's a murderer trying to lead a revolt. His name's Barabbas. Who would you like to go for? This innocent guy or this <clears throat> guilty guy? And they, they bay for Jesus' blood. In fact, they say, let his blood be upon us. You don't worry about that, Pilate. You don't worry about this man being innocent or not. We know he's not. You don't, we'll figure it out with God. You, his blood be upon us. Oh man, what were, they were saying, <laughs> they were blessing themselves because they didn't really know what kind of blood this was. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, they, and they cried for Barabbas to be set free. And just like Jesus, Joseph was sold by his brothers. Sold into slavery. And he went from slavery to the prison house, but, but that was not his purpose and destiny. And he was brought from that prison house into the palace, into Pharaoh's courts. And he was elevated in that place to be a second in charge of that whole nation. And God gave him wisdom with dreams. And he interpreted the dream. Remember the dream that Pharaoh had? There were seven fat cows and seven thin cows, and the thin cows ate the fat cows. And it was a picture that there would be seven years of just glorious abundance, and then there'd be seven years of devastating famine. And so Joseph made provision for the people. And because of this provision, because of the bread that was made, the wheat was kept, because of this, the sons of of the brothers of Joseph who, who had sold him could come down and find deliverance, salvation. And when they stood before him, when this whole thing had been uh, revealed to uh, Joseph's brothers as they kind of stood before him and realized who he was, and he said, you meant this for evil, but God meant this for good. I want to say to you, family, in closing this morning, that we may be faced, we may face in our lives famines, we may face struggles and trials and tribulations and storms and all these kinds of things. But I want to say to you this morning that God has risen one. He has raised up one to his very right hand who rules and reigns over all creation. Who has the keys to heaven's eternal storehouses and knows how to make provision for you. That what the enemy meant for evil, God will work for good. He meant it for evil, but God means it for good. That he will work out all these things for you because his intention is for you to flourish. To flourish under his care and his provision. Under his favor and his blessing. Under his grace and his peace. And God calls you this morning, I believe. He calls us this morning to awaken out of our pity parties, out of our struggles, out of our moaning and our complaining. To say God is with us and for us. Will never leave us nor forsake us. And not only is he with us, but he's gone ahead of us to make provision for us. He's faithful to provide. To see to every need. To take care of every circumstance and of every situation. God is faithful. And I want to tell you, even if that doesn't make sense, even if it doesn't work out the way you intended, it will. I'll end with this story. I was listening to Tim Keller this week. And I was listening to him for um, another reason, um, other than finding a sermon for this morning. I was listening to Tim Keller to try and get some wisdom about marriage. From, from Friday night. <laughs> so I was just preparing some stuff. And uh, he, he talks about a portion of scripture about marriage. And he's, um, and he's talking about how that Paul says, if you are single, don't seek to be married. <laughs> and if you're married, don't seek to be single. Live in a godly contentment. And, and then Paul is kind of, in, it's in 1 Corinthians, and he's talking about marriage in terms that are maybe not so wonderful. You're thinking, I shouldn't get married? Like what? Because in Ephesians 5, he was saying this is glorious. Like marriage, Ephesians 5 is like marriage is magnificent, it's wonderful. <laughs> it's the most wonderful thing. 
He's thinking, man, Paul, are you, like, are, you, like, are you drinking while you were writing parts of the Bible? Because you're not making sense here, <laughs> you know? And Tim Keller says, no, he, he thinks that Paul is making perfect sense. And what Paul is inviting us to understand and to see, that in this life, if you are single, be content. Don't be more sad than you should be about not being married. Because at the end of the story, you will be married to ever. To the one who will provide for you and care for you and take care of you. He is the, he is the groom and he's faithful. And this story, our story, the story of relationships and marriage and all these things tell a greater story of what's coming in our relationship with him for all of eternity. And so if you're single, don't be so sad. Don't be too sad. There's more for you. There's greater for you in him. But hey, 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 married people, if you're married, don't be overly happy about it. It's wonderful. Take joy in it. But you know what? Marriage speaks of a greater reality for you, hey. <laughs> a greater family for you. I love my wife. I'd love to be married to her for all eternity. But I know that if I get there and I'm not, I will be overjoyed with fellowship with him. Hey. It'll replace every, every earthly desire, every earthly treasure will just pale in the shadow of His glory and His wonder. And when we see Him, we'll just be caught up in the joy of Him. And so Paul is saying to you and I, hey, and we can relate to anything in life. Hey, if you're poor, don't be so, bad, so, don't be so, so sad about it. Don't, don't let it over, overcome you with grief. Don't be overcome with grief if you don't have a lot of money. It's okay. God's got a big plan. And if you don't get rich in this life, it's okay. You will live on a street paved with gold. It's going to get better. More glorious than you ever could imagine. And if you happen to be rich, don't be so excited about it. Because really it's something that you can't take with you. It's really not that great. It's not that, it can't buy you many things. The point is, is that we have a joy to live in that's far greater than anything this life can offer. And it's in Him. It's in the One who says, I favored you. And I found you. And you have peace with God. You have nothing to worry about. He loves you. Family this morning, the King of all creation, takes on the responsibility to make you flourish. Can you believe Him? Can you trust Him? Because ultimately you are walking to an end in which you will live in perfect flourishing with Him for all eternity. Don't be too sad. And don't be completely overjoyed with this life. Live in His peace and His joy. But it's getting better. It's getting better. I woke up this morning, I'm 46. I went to, a lot, I went to bed last night, reading a bit of Facebook, and, they, and there's this picture, I can't even remember her name, she's some actress, and she's like 60-something, and she looks like she's 20-something, and I was like, ah. <laughs> Lord, bless her with a wrinkle that she might be humbled. <laughs> Just a couple wrinkles. But I woke up this morning, and I wasn't overjoyed with being 46, but then the Lord reminded me, I just whispered to my heart again, he said, Wes, though this body, though it's getting older and it's not doing as good as it used to, and it's perishing, day by day, inwardly, inwardly, the spirit, the life I'm calling to you, is getting stronger and brighter and more glorious and more wonderful and more, because he's calling us into something way beyond. So if you can't run that five kilometer run the same way as your 16 year old son can, it's okay. Dylan borrowed my watch to go do some swimming. It pains me to see how quickly he swims. I got into the pool and I was like, I'm just going to be a porpoise. But inwardly, I'm being renewed day by day. Inwardly, it's getting better. Amen. We don't pin our hopes in this life, but on the one who reigns over all life, King Jesus. Amen. Come on, stand up with me this morning. We're going to end.
going to send you home to flourish. Amen. To flourish. Amen. In Jesus' name. Be joyed in Him. This morning I want to invite you just quickly as we pray and send you home. If you're here this morning and you have never made Jesus the King of your life. And you feel disconnected from Him. And in your heart right now this morning you're just going, I need to be right with Jesus. I'm going to pray with everybody. I'm going to send them home. And I'll invite you not to go just right then. But to come down and speak to me. Because I'd love to introduce you to the King of Kings. And begin your journey of flourishing with Him. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank You for this beautiful home. I thank You for these beautiful people created in Your image and in Your likeness. And whom You have spoken blessing and flourishing over. Who You, who you have called to be fruitful and to multiply, to bear your image and to subdue the earth and to live in your favor and in your blessing. And all through this week, Lord, may we not be underjoyed or overjoyed by this life, but may our joy be in you and in what you are able and capable of doing in us. And that, Father God, you are blessing us in ways uh, that are so beautiful and glorious and bringing us into blessing that's so beautiful and glorious. And you've done this so that we might be blessed, but also be the giver of blessing. May we be full of joy and life and peace. And may we be gracious and kind to those that are around us. May we share the gospel with joy. May we share it with, uh, with passion. And may we love on those that are around us. And Father, may we find you in the midst of all that we do. May your kingdom come. And may your will be done in and through us. In Jesus' name. Mighty name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Thank you for being with this family. Have a wonderful God filled week. We would love to pray with you if you need prayer for anything, especially if you want to make Jesus your king. Come down. But thank you guys. Thank you so much for joining us. We pray that you had a powerful and impactful time with God. We pray that again, God continues to work this word in your heart. If you have any questions or want to get a hold of us, please find us on our social media platforms where you can hear all about what we do. And don't forget to like and subscribe.